Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, it's sunny day today. Here we go. Another day in paradise. What are we now? Oh, we're past the 4th of July. We're on the 6th, according to my unfit bet. And uh, we've been busy. June is, uh, you know, busy and it's sort of gone over into July as well. I suppose things will quieten down again. We're doing um, emergency cover for another dentist. We've got this arrangement whereby he does our uh, emergencies and we do his, you know, so that we can both have a bit of time off. We're both single-handed private practitioners, although funnily enough, we've never met. Every time I say to him, uh, you know, we ought to have a meet up and have lunch, he's all, oh, I'm busy, I'm really busy, I'm really busy. And, I'm, and he is, you know, I mean, he's just a really busy bloke. So. I'm a bit more laid back. I can, I, you know, if someone says to me come out for lunch, then I've got the time to do it. You know, I can do it. And I think taking people out for lunch is good. It's a good way to uh, do business with people. They're very common in London, in the city. If you are thinking of uh, starting a business relationship, working with someone or whatever, uh, they will take you out for lunch. And, uh, you know, they're not the long, boozy lunches, but the, the first lunch actually is usually pretty lavish. The next few are can be can be reasonably lavish, but tend to be a bit more parsimonious. But the first one, it really is, you know, they obviously they've wanted to put on an impression and uh, sort of smooth you a bit and, uh, and possibly get you a bit drunk, you know, to find out so that you might be a little bit less uh, circumspect than you would be otherwise. And when we started uh, working with people like Lockton and uh, W.R. Berkeley for the uh, Shield Indemnity product, um, it was, um, you know, we, we used to get taken out for lunch. And DPAS will take you out for lunch if they're, you know, think, if you're thinking of signing up. And, uh, you know, you can, the, but the reason why it's not, I mean, I'm not just talking about how to get freebies, I'm talking about a way really of, why, why they do it and the reason is that um, you get to know someone much better you know this guy I'm doing emergency cover for I really don't know who he is I'm having to judge him by the, his patients that are coming in and they are coming in on the basis of about a rate of about one a day and uh, you know they're sort of telling me about him but I don't really know him so I need to take him out for lunch schmooze him a bit and have a chat and you only need to do it once, you know. I, once you've been out for lunch for some time once, because you're a dentist and you're used to seeing 20, 40 patients a day over however many years, um, you can get a very, very quick idea, can't you, of where they fit in the grand scheme of the general public, you know, where they fit in on the old spectrum of uh, sort of people that you come across. We're very used to summing people up quickly, and you have to do that because... Uh, you know, it's possibly you're going to stick a large needle in them in about five minutes time and so you need to know who's, you know, you need to sort of, uh, what's the word, identify, empathise with someone very quickly um, to be able to do that, you know, and for them to have the confidence. Yeah, so, <clears throat> I must um, make the time. I must make the time to go out for more lunches. That's today's resolution. Get a longer lunch break, <clears throat> two hours minimum really, because by the time you've, I and mean, we don't tend to run late, but by the time you've sort of uh, written the notes up and uh, changed and got to where you want to go, that's half an hour, isn't it? So if you've only got a one hour lunch, then that's no use, and then you don't want to be rushing back. If you ask someone out for lunch and they're like, um, you know, well, I don't know why, why do you, why do you want to do that sort of thing, then that in itself is a just an indicator, you know, it's just a, a little a, a small red flag as to they're all like, you know, what's what's the problem, you know, and it shouldn't be a problem to go out for lunch. Just go out, and have a chat, and they are quite, um, you know, when when you're talking to someone like who's like a, quite high up in world's largest insurance company you think oh it's, it's going to be really formal you know 
Uh, but they're not actually they're almost the opposite they are um, very uh, how can I put it you do go into depth on both sides you know saying about how you got to where you are today what your ambitions are you know what your interests are who, who who your partner is, whether you've got children, what your children are doing, etc. And it's just like, um, it's it's not, you know, an unpleasant experience. In fact, I'd say it's a pleasant experience. It's supposed to be. And at the end of the day, you know, perhaps you've got a bit of a bond there. You've found a shared interest. Um, you both know that you're harmless, hopefully. And uh, and uh, there's a basis there, isn't there, to build on to, uh, you know, so that, you know, perhaps if you next time you get a couple of tickets for the opera you can ring someone up and say I've got a couple of tickets for the opera do you fancy going or, or do the four of us fancy going or uh, do uh, or do you like uh, like oh, so Julian English I think used to buy tickets for the cricket and a lot of uh, his mates were found themselves at England test matches not me of course I don't like cricket, to be honest with you. <laughs> cricket is one of the one of the few things in life I really never found an explanation for. I mean, I know there, I know that there is a class of people called the idle rich, and that they have, you know, they don't need to work, so they have to find something to do with their. And I know, obviously, there's there's another class in society of rabid cricket fans, who uh, save up and spend all their money following the team all over the world. But um, and I sort of my my sort of Protestant work ethic meant that I was working Monday to Saturday lunchtime, and I honestly didn't see how um, you could find any time in the normal working week, the normal working week for cricket, which was always on over three days and was always on during the week. So how how could you participate? You were working. Do you know what I mean? You were working. Uh, unless you worked in uh, the hospital service or the community dental service but the hospital dental service in particular during test match days was hopeless you just couldn't get anything done couldn't speak to anyone couldn't get a phone answered um, you know uh, <laughs> they're talking about mortality rates I reckon mortality rates in hospitals went up more due to cricket matches than they ever did for weekends We go oh junction of death with no death inside that's amazing so we um, you know I'm still getting a few message back uh, about um, the, the barber episode and the fees etc the the rule of thumb and it's a uh, worthwhile remembering and uh, I've heard this from several people but uh, Peter Schiff, the American economic commentator and uh, advocate of uh, having having uh, part of your wealth in gold, gold and silver, because um, he he's a, doesn't believe in government issued currencies. He only believes in uh, solid um, assets that retain their value if the fiat currency goes down the pan. And he expressed it very well today when he said that if you have 2% inflation, which is what the government targets, then uh, your, the purchasing power of your money halves every 20 years. And that's a shocking uh, admission, you know, it's a shocking fact. I don't think many people know that. This was Barbara's problem, of course. <clears throat> and um, what Schiff pointed out was that uh, if you live to be 80 and Barbara was 72 and your money <coughs> excuse me if your money halves in purchasing power every 20 years then what cost a pound when you were born costs uh, 16 pounds when you're 80 and so uh, because it's it starts off at one then it doubles to two doubles to four doubles to eight doubles to 16 right so it's just, over your lifetime, the purchasing power of your money will depreciate by 16 times. And this was uh, Barbara's problem, you know, she couldn't understand why uh, I was charging her £65 for a checkup, x-rays and re veneer, which she thought 
should be more around the sort of eight to ten pounds mark. <laughs> and I'm, I'm experiencing it as well, you know. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> I still can't quite shift that cold in our hand. But no, I'm experiencing it as well. But in most uh, recently, uh, I mean, the way that people notice it, except that they don't really notice it, is in the price of houses. Because as we all know, the utility, the value in a house is static. It uh, keeps the same number of bedrooms, same number of roofs. But the amount of money required to buy it changes. And, uh, you know, my house now, although I only bought it like 15 years ago, um, is now worth nearly twice what I paid for it. And that, you know, for me is absolute uh, absolute demonstration of the, you know, I'm coming up for 20 years and the purchasing power of all my money has halved. So even I'm looking at prices and thinking, you know, I go sort of, I go in, when well, you go in a pub always and think the beer's expensive, but you can go in a cafe now and, you know, I'm amazed that they're still making cups of tea for £1.50. I mean, I know that cups of tea used to be 20 pence, but I, I still, you know, the, the, for those of you whose wages have managed to keep pace <clears throat> with this inflation in the money supply, good for you. Uh, and you're probably going to be people who are in employment and who have em employment, probably self-employment, where you can ratchet up your fees, your prices, in line with the devaluation in the money. The people who um, are most disadvantaged, or, or the groups of people who are most disadvantaged, are people who are employed where they rely on their employers to put their money up. And the employers have not at all uh, kept wages up with the increase or the decrease in the purchasing power of the currency. And this ridiculous 1% uh, pay uh, uh, cap in the public sector is, well, when I say it's ridiculous, the spending in the public sector is out of control. And one of the ways that you, you know, you, you, you might think that you could keep spending under control was, was to put a cap on wages. Because we all know that wages are by far and away the biggest cost, aren't they, in any service sector provision my wages bill is is my biggest cost uh, so you think well okay I'll put the wages down or keep try and keep the wages down keep the cost down but you know it's a much bigger problem there are distortions in the market in the service uh, sector and in dentistry in particular which mean that things are not what they should be you know the and this is a whole other subject. This is distortion <clears throat> of markets by sort of government interference in markets and the distortion that it causes. And the, the problems that those distortions cause are a whole other journey to work. But uh, I, you know, I feel that uh, there are bargains to be had <clears throat> for people who are managing to keep their income in. In, uh, in line. If you're an employee, then you are suffering, and that's why living standards now are uh, you know, not improving and are still very low, uh, relatively, I think relatively to where they should be. Um, and the other big group that's affected, of course, is savers. Uh, savers are people who are trying to preserve their wealth, they're trying, trying to buy, which I mean they're trying to preserve their purchasing power. They have uh, built up a, a stock of purchasing power, and uh, perhaps during you know at a time when they were employed, and um, they are now non-productive. You know, economically they're not productive, and so they're trying to preserve the purchasing power that they've got in real terms. By which means you know they have to beat this two percent inflation every year, otherwise uh, their purchasing power of their their purchasing power decreases. So if you just, if you're getting paid 0% on your 
savings, which a lot of people are, or near as, then, um, you know, thanks to the fact that the government is targeting this 2%, your, the purchasing power of your weight, your stock, your stash, is going to decrease by 2% every year. And uh, 20 years later, it's half of it's evaporated. So, as dentists, I think we're pretty lucky because for the most part we are self-employed. And we can and we should keep, we, we should maintain this 2% ratchet, you know, every year. We have to keep up with inflation. Uh, with the government's, the government's target is to make our money worthless. And our target is to, is to get more of it so that our purchasing power remains the same. So if you haven't put your fees up this year, then I suggest, and I, in fact this is now what I've decided I'm going to do, I'm going to go to work and put my fees up 2% across the board. I'm going to do that today. Because I can't... If you don't, then you're on course for a 50% pay cut in over 20 years. And none of us can afford that, you know, we really can't. And shouldn't have to, you know. It's, dentists we're highly skilled workers we are we're skilled in the three areas of business manual dexterity and uh, academia and there are very few jobs that require that and therefore the uh, labor is worthy of his hire as they say Yellen the Fed chair Janet Yellen chair of the Federal Reserve invented in 1913 I think when a dollar was worth a dollar and now uh, is now worth two cents. I'll say that again. In 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar, and now in 1913 dollars, a 2017 dollar is worth two cents. <laughs> Thanks to the Fed uh, printing money and inflating the money supply, so that they've far more dollars and nobody wants them. So they they're worth less, <laughs> worth less, not quite worth less yet, but they're worth two cents. has been in the London recently and I am not a conspiracy theorist but I do try and read between the lines of what's going on and she ostensibly came over and gave a talk and the talk was notable for one thing which was her statement that you know 2008 collapse was terrible but um, we are unlikely to see another economic shock of that magnitude in our lifetime. I don't know why, what she's basing that on, perhaps that she thinks the last one was the 1930s and then the, the most recent one was 2008 and so we're not due another one till about 2150. But, or perhaps she meant in her lifetime, which might not be as long as she thinks. But um, she also uh, popped into the King George the what? What's his face? The hospital for the royals. You know the hospital where anybody in the royal family gets sick? They go to this hospital, don't they? This special funny hospital in London, the King is it Edward the something or other, the George the something the hospital, I forget. Anyway, I don't need to know, I'm never gonna go there. <laughs> but it's the go-to place for um, anyone who's uh, you know, who's like a really like a VVV VIP who's sick. And I don't know what they do there. I think they perhaps they got some alien healing ray there or something, some alien technology that's housed there. But anyway, if you go, you you go there if you're very important and you're sick. And she just popped in, and and that's too much of a coincidence. I don't, you know. I mean, I think someone in America has said to Janet Yellen, "We, you need a second opinion from." these guys in London they are the best at this uh, you'll have to fly over to London and they will they will examine you and uh, I don't know use the alien healing way on you whatever and what we'll do is we'll cover it up as a book tour or a speaking engagement and if she just shut up and, and not made this stupid statement about us never having another financial crash in our lifetime then nobody would have noticed but they did notice uh, because because uh, she uh, she said it and so therefore it sort of attracted suspicion to because I mean she wouldn't have flown to the UK to say this thing do you know what I mean she's not 
she was inter interviewed as a courtesy, really. And if you listen to her speech, actually most of it was absolutely nothing. I mean, that's what she's famous for saying nothing. And she, in the speech, she said nothing apart from this one thing. And so, and that made the headlines because that was the only thing she said. But it was quite significant. And um, I don't believe she would have flown over to London just to make this completely anodyne speech and say that, you know, everything's fine. And then just pop into the King George the What's It Hospital. So, I don't, you can, just you make your own minds up. Personally, if you listen to her speak, I think she may have had a mini stroke. That's, and can, that's complete speculation. And um, I don't know, I don't know anything. But I just, it fits the facts, you know, the... The fact she's come over to the hospital, she's and when she talks now, she's she's not saying anything in a, in an almost like in an intellectual way that she's almost sort of struggling just to maintain a basic level of the the appearance that she still knows what she's talking about. Whereas I think some there seems to me some higher functions are missing. She may have had a series of mini strokes. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised. If you listen to her speak, she's got that sort of speech which is very characteristic of someone who's had a had a minor stroke. Um, <clears throat> which is, you know, which is a little bit worrying. And not so much worrying that, um, you know, we may lose the chair of the Fed because they've had plenty of chairs of the Fed. But uh, it's more worrying that we may have someone who's had a mini stroke who's still running the Fed. That's the worrying thing. But like I say, that's just pure speculation. I have not got a clue. They might announce it tomorrow. It might be, it's maybe that she's spoken like that all her life. I don't know. They'd have to look at some film of her when she was like 20 and see if she still spoke with that slow drawl. But um, anyway, that's today's conspiracy theory. Just, uh, you know, make up your own and post them in and uh, we'll uh, give them some air time, see if we can get a meme going. All right. <laughs> Off to work. See you tomorrow. Bye.